Uh, I'm Sharad Agarwal. I'm the founder of OnlyWebinars.com and uh, CEO of a digital agency called CyberGear. Um, I got into this business early in 1996, and I still recall my first uh, presentation it used to be uh, 10 good reasons why you should have a web presence. And that has slightly changed now because now it says 10 good reasons why you should be in the metaverse. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's 1996 all over again. And it's good to be a first mover. I love to be a leader rather than be a follower. And I hope uh, all my panelists uh, will agree with that. So here we are today with another show. And this time it is the economic reality of virtual experiences. I think it's a very relevant topic, uh, especially when the conversation is around ROE, return on engagement, and then perhaps ROI, return on investment. So um, I'm happy to welcome our audience and our panelists. And I will let uh, Susan Furness, our moderator for this show, uh, do the introductions. But first, it's my honor and privilege to introduce Susan to you. She's a dear friend. I've known her for 30 plus years. We are both based in Dubai, though I know uh, today Susan is checking in from the UK. So very quickly about Susan, uh, she's a meta shaper. She actually gave me this uh, nomenclature. And so I created this community website called Meta Shapers. So she's a strategic communications expert, as you will see. She provides voice and vocabulary to meaningful conversations such as this one. So uh, welcome uh, to the show, Susan, and I'll let you take this forward. Whenever you need to reach out to me, I'm around. Over to you, Susan. Oh, well, thank you, Sharad, bless you. And thank you all for coming uh, today because I'm truly excited um, about this conversation. Um, I mean, you know, uh, as I said in one of my posts, we all need a, a foundation uh, of some sorts when we're creating new things, even if it's a new Victoria sponge and we're baking the cake, we need a foundation to put it on, right? Otherwise, when we cut it, it just will go all over the shop. So, you know, really to discuss um, that title that's behind this uh, arm, you know, the economic reality of virtual experiences really speaks to the strategist in me and definitely speaks to the alternative strategist in me. Um, and that alternative strategist is very much um, uh, excited to be on this train, as you call it, Sherrod, you know, this metaverse, this Web3 train, even if I'm not sure which carriage I'm in yet or what I'm doing, you know, because we're now all learning on the job. And um, we had a little preamble audience, a little talk, um, you know, a few times with the panelists in, in, on your screen today. And, uh, you know, we just want to say to you, one thing is that uh, we're all learning this together. Yes, there are some of us um, that, you know, got a few decades on us, like Gerard and I, and indeed Danny, who's in the middle of my screen. Give us a wave, Danny, so everyone can see you. You know, but we are all on this together and, and we're all learning together. So please, you know, fire any questions in the chat. The, the, the panel here will pick them up and either reply now or later on LinkedIn uh, and just keep connected and just get yourselves out there. Uh, I mean, just like our panel have, and I'm going to start with you, Sammy. I mean, if anyone's got themselves out there and dressed the part, it's you. I mean, you know, such a... a oh, you know, we've only had shared a few words together, and I've said this three times already today, and it's just such a great connection. You really use some great vocabulary, and not only that, you then use that spark in other ways by really creating the space. So, Sammy, you know, a super hero heroine, a super sentient, an AI character, tell us a little bit about you. One minute, Sammy. Thank you so much for the lovely intro and hello everyone it's lovely to meet you all um yes i'm tuning in now as like uh, this VTuber avatar called vinci uh so i'm streaming live out of unreal engine and i'm wearing a, a rococo motion capture suit my iphone's capturing my face capture data but yes uh, my name's sammy my company's vinci it's a multimedia company in the metaverse i'm a storyteller at heart and i love community well 
you've joined the right community here because you know uh, the catalyst for us is this Sherard who just doesn't know how to stop building community. Sherard, you've got eight brands now or eight community spaces. And I want to applaud you for that because offline you just said that it's in four months. So four, eight, 12, 16 weeks, 17 weeks. I mean, really, you've created a, a run, wonderful a conduit for us all. So you're absolutely right, Sammy. Uh, thank you for stressing that. And I'm going to sort of take this over now um, you know, into the sort of founding space still. Um, Mario, um, we were talking a little earlier and sort of a bit on our LinkedIn chats. Um, you know, you, you're all about getting to the underneath of something that's in its founding stages, but also carrying it forward. And, and I heard with joy that you're actually looking at even taking something to IPO very soon, within days. Can you talk to us a little bit about you? using that founding uh, nugget, Mario? Yeah, sure. So I've been building businesses for, for a pretty long time, but in crypto started in 2017 with IBC Group that most people know. Um, and now that incubates and accelerates projects. But the exciting company is NFT Tech. So for the first time, you know, I'll be leading a public company with a board, with investors. Um, I, I'm expect I have to be careful what I say. I'm expected to lead a public company, et cetera. Um, so... Pretty deep in the space, uh, my job is really to know where to de deploy capital and when. Um, and yeah, my, my obsession has been the metaverse for over over a year or two. Not as long as Danny, but uh, but uh, longer than most still. Ah, I'm glad you mentioned Danny. I'm coming to you next, Danny. But, but tell me, Mario, just before I, I pop off over to the center of my screen, um, when you say deploy capital, are you talking money only or do you call current uh, capital other currencies like talent and ideas and creativity? Both. So we incubate uh, clients. When we incubate clients, obviously, we have our resources to help them find investors, get on an exchange. Uh, we'll start doing NFT projects recently as well. Um, so a lot of you know, similar to any other incubator or accelerator. So we talked about Faith earlier. That's a project we accelerated, for example. Um, and of course, deploying capital and investing in projects. We invest very, um, very heavily. All right. Well, thank you for stretching, stretching that. And Faith is Faith Tribe, right? Um, yeah, we Faith Tribe. Up Faith Tribe, yeah. Okay, lovely to have you here, Dejana. We'll get to you in a tick. Hi, hi. Uh, but Danny, can you take this? You know, as, as Mario said, you know, you really are a seasoned founder. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about yourself on that yourself on that springboard of why foundations are so important, or are they? Over to you. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, I, I am probably the the veteran of the group here. You know, I, I've been uh, interested in building three D platforms for the web since uh, well, pre internet was doing things called garage VR, building you know, virtual reality kits uh, from scrap of, of various. Uh, uh, tech. Uh, and that, that was very interesting. And, and the, the metaverse back then when we were building the internet was called things like a, the, the internet was called a series of tubes or the information superhighway, or people would talk about surfing the web. Uh, and the metaverse was called cyberspace way back then. Uh, and, and these ideas were just interesting and fascinating. Everybody was definitely discussing them, but the technology wasn't quite there. And uh, you know, it's just so exciting to be back in this, this topic of the metaverse that people are discussing because a lot of the same ideas are coming back up again, but powered by new technology and a whole group of new people with passion that uh, we've not seen the likes of before. So th this is incredibly exciting. And the, the, the fact that people can get started with zero capital now and just you know, launch something into um, the information sphere is absolutely wonderful. Uh, we're now talking about the real-time web uh, and you know in our businesses I've got a platform a 3d platform called uh, mood up uh, and that allows us to have virtual meetings and events you know it, it really is the time now that the web engages and adopts 3d as a media type I can talk about that later but yeah it is it is just one of the most exciting times I feel like it's almost like at the beginning of the internet again uh, that, that people are, have this massive excitement and uh, you know I'm so uh, Grateful to be on the panel with all these great young people who are you know, embarking on amazing journeys and also all the participants that are here today. I see there's quite a few. So hopefully we've got a number of other people that are also engaged in this and uh, I look forward to you know, sharing what we know. Here, here, Danny. I mean, you said um, some things I could see many of us sort of 
doing body language nods on screen. So thank you for so for being you know a, a voice for us all. And indeed, um, we'll come back to that zero capital later because this is all about economics today. So please hold that point. And I'm going to come over to you, um, if I might, Neo. Um, you know, um, because Danny talked a bit about early days technology. And you, of course, are very much in the forefront of today's uh, technology in your role, and particularly from the research and develop development side. And, you know, and in this curious corona time that we've just come through, where, you know, research of, I don't know, BC, as I call it, before corona, really doesn't hang anymore, does it? And indeed, is there any research that really hangs on the metaverse? I think you're just going to be such a great nugget to our conversation. But tell us a little bit about yourself, um, Neo. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. I am Neo. I am uh, a head of technology efficacy at Clayton Foundation. So when you look at Clayton, it's one of these uh, major layer one uh, blockchain ecosystem that we have in the industry. But going back to the point, like um, before COVID, obviously uh, the research, uh, we have a lot of focus on, on, on different ways, like, you know, AI, uh, traceability and all this kind of thing that could be applied to the supply chain. But uh, when, uh, when we look we at... And when we look at what we have today after that, um, obviously is, uh, yeah, people put it in a right way to call it metaverse, but uh, to me, it's more like a decentralized way of uh, diversify, um, you know, um, the creator economies that we have been talking about right here. And that could be uh, on different aspects, but I think we're going to cover different topics uh, during this panel. Um, yeah, that will be me. Uh, this is Neil. Nice to meet you, everybody. Yeah, oh, nice to meet you too. Uh, Neo, please um, hold that bit about research and development. We're really interested to know where that's spinning at the minute. Um, I'm going to go um, and welcome Dejana now, Dejana, and then I'll come to you, Adrian, to sort of really finish our intros off on real product. So, um, Dejana, hi, lovely to have you. Thanks for coming in. And uh, what I really want to do is to get to hear about a little bit about you. Um, you know, as this seasoned entrepreneur and indeed where you fit in in going forward to build the seasons as a metapreneur and um, very much talk into that um, sort of investment bit, you know, angel investment or even pre-seed, you know, seed, you know, all of that stuff. Just introduce yourself around it and then we'll begin to unpick at, uh, as we go through, Dejana. Over to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Susan, for this warm welcome, Sherrod, for having me. And also thank you to Danny for calling us young. I will take that any day. Uh, <laughs> so a uh, really quick introduction. I am the CEO and founder of DK uh, Advisors, and I've been 14 years now capital raising. And essentially, when I had first started my career on Wall Street trading stocks, it's very interesting to see the trajectory of how you trade stocks, you know, you wait for a couple of days, weeks, months, years to really see anything, to see any kind of movement. And then we transitioned into this crypto space. And now we're in NFT where you blink and then you miss something. So um, what, what we're doing now is really focusing on uh, sourcing a lot of really great startup opportunities to uh, within Web3 to then introduce it into VCs because what we're still seeing, apart from Silicon Valley, obviously, is VCs are still very antiquated in how they see opportunities. So I sit in this very, very interesting position and role of how to, number one, get founders in the Web3 space, really become investor attractive. And then number two is getting a lot of this, uh, we like to say, old money and really um, position it going into being massively supportive into the Web3 movement because we're not going anywhere. So uh, after 14 years of capital raising, almost $180 million uh, you know, raised in several different stages and with companies, um, I can say that uh, anyone who is involved in this industry at its absolute early stages is what I consider all of us here, early adopters. We have such an incredible way of being able to build a sustainable future based on everything that we're doing. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me on this panel. And I'm super excited to connect with everyone. Uh, well, here, here, Dejana, we're super excited to connect with you too. And 
And I think the bit that we need to, we could pluck so much out of what you've just said, but hold that old money bit because, you know, we, you know, retro or whatever we want to call it, we might need some of it, right, reinvested. And I, I have been quite interested, uh, those of you that are in the investment space, um, and we can maybe, uh, and we will go on to this, I've made a note of it, so hold this one, that, you know, how we encourage investors who got on the bandwagon, rightly so, and I want them to stay there, of societal impact investment or impact investing to really now take some of that into the meta space, uh, metaverse, meta space too. So please, um, you're nodding, please hold that and we'll come back to it. But I really want to go right into some product now. And that's into you, Adriana. And, you know, and again, a born storyteller like our fabulous Sammy, uh, uh, you know, and I love to sort of tell a bit of a story as well. So, um, you know, but you really use your art and your creativity. So you're able to to turn that now into tangibles with the NFTs. Um, talk to us about you and why this is really grabbing your, you know, the wings beneath your sails for the next era, Adriana. Uh, thank you so much, Susanna. And so thank you, Sherrod, for having me. I'm really excited to be a part of this exciting panel. Uh, so I'm a fashion artist and art director with uh, 10 years of experience in the fashion and luxury industry. And I discovered NFTs first uh, before Web3 and Metaverse about a year ago uh, through Clubhouse. This is the application that uh, join, a lot of people can join into uh, conversations. And as soon as I understood the concept of NFTs, I knew that was something for me because my work is mainly digital and it combines a lot of aspects like animation and music and also fashion film. So I just felt that's gonna be the, something I waited for for most of my life. Um, and again, like you just said, Susanna, it's just um, a wonderful way of expression for artists. And I'm sure like Sami can agree is that doesn't really limit you to one medium anymore. And I think that's such a very revolutionary aspect of NFTs that we don't have to present ourselves as artists in only one medium anymore. And there's so many um, attached values to NFTs that, you know, like the um, accessible items within the digital world and that they can link to so many uh, different aspects of selling goods and products and also like uh, even tickets to concerts. So I feel this is something revolutionary, very exciting. And right now I think Instagram today just announced there's first trials and uh, of launching NFTs throughout the platform as well. So I'm quite excited to see where it's gonna go because still we're very early in the stages of NFTs, but I think moments like that will also enable more people to be onboarded into Web3. Yeah, yeah, couldn't agree more. And in fact, I might stay with you, Adriana, on definition, because one of the things that Sherrod and I really like to do in these um, conversations is to help clear some of the gray space for our listeners. And you're right, Danny, the numbers are notching up. We're now at 61 are on screen, which is super. So thank you very much for joining. So Adriana, I mean, can I keep in the NFT space? Can you give us a quick definition? Yes, so obviously uh, NFT stands for non-fungible token, which um, as I explain to people who are very clueless about the NFTs, it's simply a token or an asset, digital asset that can be encrypted into blockchain and then therefore it can be sold or purchased through the cryptocurrency. So this has been like the easiest way of uh, explaining the NFTs. And also, and I think another uh, important factor why it has been so... Uh, crucial within uh, art world right now is that this is the first time in the um, history of art, I would say, and I'm a digital artist, where we can legally and physically, well, it's not physically, but it's happening on the blockchain, but we can um, sell our digital content, which is, uh, which hasn't been before previously available at all, because Art industry has been limited to selling physical goods, like uh, we're talking the same about clothing and paintings and anything that we can hold in our hands or touch and feel them, right? And now um, also something that really um, enables other people to understand was the NFT possibilities that so-called JPEG can be now sold as piece of art. And obviously I know there's a huge debate on NFTs, whether uh, people want, don't want to invest in something that's uh, digital, but also to give you the example is that why would you think that an NFT, let's say a digital art piece um, has been 
created with less effort and talent than a physical painting because there's years of um, experience. There's also huge talent often involved and also well, there's expertise and creativity, the same put input in the same way of creating a digital creation. It's just that this is this has been differently created, if that makes sense. So instead of using the paints, I'm just talking about my own experience. I'm using digital tools like Procreate or Photoshop, and it doesn't require any less of the talent, if that makes sense. So uh, I think and it's wonderful, really Adriana, because exactly. all of this is accessible to us all, isn't it? And you know, there is that thing that you say, "Do you can you sing?" And everyone says, sort of, oh, no, I really can't, yeah. I really can. But of course, we all can sing. It's just how we sing, right? Exactly. So, yeah, so I'm loving that. Thank you so much for giving us some, you know, some stretch on that definition. And which now let's get us, let's sort of go frame. I don't like to call it framework. It's not framework at all. So Susan, scrap that language. The, the, the space that we're in, Web3. Um, Dejana, can, can you sort of give us some... I don't know, context around Web3, what on earth is it? Thank you so much, Susan. So, uh, you know, to really piggyback off of um, what Ariana, Adriana, excuse me, was just saying, Web3 really is a great opportunity for all of these brands, uh, excuse me, I don't want to even say brands because now we've, um, you know, repositioned ourselves out of that, but for all of these really great ideas to come to life in a more realistic fashion and for people to be even honed in and, 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 and closer. I think the beauty about um, Web3 is that a lot of the uh, challenges that we did face in, in Web2, we have a uh, we have two opportunities here. Number one, taking all of the things that were done right and then just being able to elevate it. Um, and then number two is seeing all of the blind spots that were missed um, when we were really navigating to web two and then really um, putting ourselves and putting our ideas and really being able to build and grow in a very, 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 um, uh, interesting way that allows all of us to, to hone in as a community. Um, I think what blockchain has done for us is hold one another accountable because now everything is out there, right? So we can really see what works, what isn't working, and we have the data right in front of us. And there's, you know, um, all of us are now involved versus, look, I'm coming from the traditional um, financial space and there was a lot of things that were hidden from the public, right? When we're when we're seeing from um, you know from uh, venture capitalists, from um, private equities, there were a lot of these businesses that didn't even have like websites, but they would move millions and millions of dollars daily, and we didn't know why or we didn't know how. Now, as we are um, growing and evolving in blockchain and having all of these companies, um, you know, really using that accessibility we're seeing why everything is happening. We have the data in front of us and then we can, we can emulate it, we can make it better. Um, we can bring in other people who uh, we know are able to um, put their best foot forward. So I think just the accountability of all of this is what's shifting the market very, very fast because we can make decisions in real time. Let me take that there and, and I'm gonna go not going to go in any order now for these definitions. I'm going to take that blockchain. Um, um, I'm going to bounce from blockchain, if you like, you know, because, of course, it is a crucial ingredient, isn't it? And Neo, can I come over to you and give us some stretch around blockchain? And then, Danny, I'm going to come up to you in a minute just to pull us in. Yeah. Uh, Neo. Sure. Uh, high level, um, blockchain is a distributed database. Then you think about all this kind of state that you store in the database is immutable and how people make the changes on the state or operating the state that you store in this database is actually via a distributed node of network. So you will have a node of computer network that will be running or validating transactions and building block based on a specific consensus algorithm. So I think previously you heard about uh, Bitcoin, which is based on proof of work. Uh, at that time, back in 2014, 15, we phrase that as a blockchain 1.0 because essentially we only care about whether you will have a immutable record like that of the transactions that you're gonna have. But starting from blockchain 2.0, that will be uh, that was actually the exciting part. Keep coming in was 
Finally, we have smart contract uh, engine, not just a smart contract, uh, which is a bunch of uh, uh, decentralized uh, features or functions out there, uh, which is a piece of software. But then the software engine, uh, which is the virtual machine, um, essentially Ethereum's virtual machine, was the blockchain 2.0. Uh, that is uh, enabling a, a lot of uh, logic. For example, Web3 is all about the ownership. Now we talk about the Web3 ownership, yes, but it's actually enabled uh, by the smart contract uh, method and features that could be enabled the dApps off chain as well, so that uh, people can actually interact with it with different use cases built on you know different layer one. So when we talk about layer zero, layer one, or layer two, they are all blockchain infrastructures, but they are still you know working with the same, but not uh, I mean quite similar uh, uh, blockchain infrastructures. Just the differences is on the consensus algorithm. So okay. well, uh, do you very know quickly. What? Go on, oh, yeah. go, no, go on, Neo. Tell me, go on very quickly. So um, when I say similar, uh, why? Because um, the only difference is, yes, you have so many two links around that. But when you look at the consensus is the main point that you look at. You can think about consensus is just how you design these uh, block winners of the next block that you have alongside on the blockchain. So you think about blockchain as a data structures. Yes, um, I think that will be something that's very straightforward to the audience as well to understand it. Well, thank you. I mean, because what I was going to say, I feel that I'm sure you're thinking it as well, Sharad, that there need, could be a conversation here because um, uh, Sharad has issued, uh, has published a number of months ago now, uh, very early on, a metaverse glossary. And I can still, I can see some uh, additions going in from the conversation so far, Sharad, particularly in this, in, in blockchain 2.0. Do you, Sharad? Uh, we are actually constantly updating the glossary because, you know, the metaverse itself is evolving. And uh, as I always say, it is developing at the speed of thought. So this is a 24 by 7 world we live in. So um, I've put the link already out there in the chat for all the newbies in the room to update themselves with the glossary. There is a URL you can follow and uh, literally we are updating it uh, twice a week. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much for that. Um, so, Danny, I'm coming to you and then Mario over to you to, and then Sammy, last but not least. So, so Danny, I mean, you know, I sort of tempted to ask you about definitions around everything um, virtual or X. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you could do that, you know, give us a bit of a spin on virtual reality, MXR, et cetera, et cetera um, MRX. But um, also about what you've just heard, Danny. From these yeah, years sure. Experience. So yeah, I really, really want to thank Adriana for her really um, accessible um, description of NFTs. Uh, you know, I'd usually explain it uh, also that the, the blockchain stores the title to an item, not the item itself, um, but you know, some sort of ownership uh, token essentially. Um, we're still trying to solve being able to store assets, you know, significant size assets of different types in the in the blockchain itself. But there are solutions coming for that rather on than on distributed uh, file systems. And Neo, really great description of uh, blockchain technology there. I really like the aspect that, you know, if you can describe it quite simply as almost a public transparent database uh, that is immutable is a really nice way uh, to, to really introduce people to the concept. Because I think a lot of people, you know, still don't quite understand you know what blockchain is, but uh, that transparency uh, is just a fantastic aspect of um, letting people know that it's there to be seen and uh, cannot be changed. Right? It's in, improbable, next to impossible, for that to be changed, depending on the network, of course. Uh, but I'd like to talk about the definition of metaverse because the metaverse is actually got a really messy definition floating around. And for me, uh, you know, being a um, you know a very early adopter of the internet and also a sci-fi fan, uh, you know, the, for me, it's always been this immersive virtual world that you can jump into, uh, right? That you can you can be in a virtual environment with other people that are separated by distance around the world, and you can have a shared experience in a shared space. So for me, that that's kind of the definition of metaverse. But what I see happening in the media and around everywhere essentially can fall into three buckets for the definition of metaverse. One is the metaverse for entertainment or games. So we're talking about things like Roblox and Sandbox and um, you know, Decentraland, even Fortnite. You know, people are describing those games as the metaverse. Really, they're meaning a, sh a shared 3D environment that you can go into. Some use blockchain, some don't. 
uh, but the concept of being in a shared environment is, is part of it. And these often have the concept of land sales, the idea that I can buy a property, somebody can buy a property next door to me. Uh, I have no control over who buys properties next to me. So if I'm, you know, Amazon and, and some adult store sets up next to me, I have no control over that. Uh, land can be sold and, and transferred. And then this is great for a, a virtual world that has artificial scarcity built in just to, to help, uh, you know, create revenue or demand. Uh, then the, the second kind of description of the metaverse is really what the blockchain community has adopted, right? Blockchain community is you know, early adopters really pushing the future forward and they can see where that ties together, where the idea of this 3D shared experience and virtual assets can go hand in hand with blockchain technology. So you'll see a lot of the stuff that's blockchain described as metaverse. Some of them don't even have any 3D aspect at all, but they're still going to use the word metaverse and that's going to appear in the media and that creates a little bit of confusion. But I do see them as on a you know, very tight course together in the future. And the third definition of metaverse is kind of in the area that, that I work in, which is called the metaverse for business, which is uh, about the, using the metaverse on the web as a 3D media type. Now, if, if you'll give me a moment to describe a little bit of a deeper philosophy about that, uh, it, when the internet came about, we used a lot of existing content and just digitized it. I'm talking images, you know, photos, audio, uh, music, uh, text, and, and video, so or film. So we took all those media and we threw it online and we started using it. We've used those media types ever since, really to great effect. But 3D as a media type is really young. It's only been around as long as computers have. Before that, we, we had architecture and maybe you know, sculpture as a 3D description. But digitally, we have this new media type uh, called 3D. But it's been in fragmented all over the place, being able to just like we do with video, you, you, you click on a video online, you can watch it on your phone, tablet, laptop, doesn't matter, you know it's going to work. It didn't used to be like that with video. It was codecs and plugins and all sorts of messes in the early days. Same with 3D. But now, over the last couple of years, we've now got 3D as a media type that works in every browser on every device. And this is a critical point for where uh, the metaverse for business and the metaverse for web uh, and Web3 can succeed. We now can load a 3D space, we can load 3D content on any device just by following a link. And this is extraordinarily accessible. And it's just, just the tipping, we're at the very beginning, the foothills of how 3D is now going to be another media type alongside video, images, audio, and text. And that being just at the beginning is a huge opportunity. Yeah, it's been mature in games and architecture and all these silos in different ways, but now it's going to hit the web. Uh, unfortunately, the web is not as powerful as, you know, PlayStation or, you know, PC, gaming PC, but they're on a collision course, all three. I'm talking about the, the metaverse for entertainment games, the metaverse for blockchain, and the metaverse for business, or the web, are all on a, a course of convergence over the next three, five years. And that's what's really, really exciting. So hopefully those three definitions of the metaverse help some context but also give you an idea of, uh, you know, if you're deciding on to get involved in the metaverse, where, where you want to position yourself. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. That was really quite rich. And I think we were all scribbling some notes. Um, Mario, go on, take, take that away. And uh, a course for convergence, you know, what's going to happen there when they all come together, if you agree. Yeah. Um... Look, I think the, the definition that Danny gave is a very interesting definition. So I've, I've heard many definitions of this space and I'll travel the world giving the same definition time and time again. Mine is pretty simple. I, I try to keep it simple. It's just a, you know, I call the metaverse a digital representation of the physical world we live in today. Um, that's pretty broad because then it's just hard to, to, to and it's pretty easy to understand. Um, and then I kind of separate it into different categories, web one metaverse. It doesn't really count as a metaverse because it's not synchronous. But then you got the Web2 metaverse, which is, you know, we're on Zoom now instead of sitting in a, in a, in a boardroom. Um, you know, Instagram filters are the new makeup. So it's a, it's a digital representation of the physical world. Now, I come from the Web3 world um, and I'm Web3 native. So I always add this to the definition because we want an open metaverse. Um, so I add without predetermined physics because the in the digital world, you can't own things. You couldn't own things as you do in the physical world. Like I own this phone, okay? I own this shirt. I don't own this, but, you know, the person next to me owns it. So they're mine. When I've traveled to a new country, which I do often, I don't need to prove this is my T-shirt. No one asks me why, because 
physics allows me to wear it. And they allow me to put the phone in my pocket or in my home or in my hotel room. And based on this, phys, you know, this, this ability to put things within a certain, you know, certain locations, it makes them your ownerships without having a certificate. Now, how can you do that in the digital world? Because anyone can copy paste and there's no way to prove that you own something unless there's a third party that says you own it. Whether it's YouTube saying you own that video, Instagram ain't saying you own that photo or a bank saying you own those numbers on the screen. Well, that's what NFTs, you know, Adriana gave a great definition of NFTs. NFTs essentially just allow digital ownership. Forget about art, forget about collectibles, which are big pillars of NFTs and what brought the, the mainstream attention to the space. They're not just that, they're just the ability to own something online. And that allows for the Web3 metaverse to function because now the concept of ownership exists in the web. And that opens up the possibilities of being able to own your own assets, to build your own, um, you know, your own assets, your own value and transfer that value. Um, but I also don't want people to, to, you know, fall under the trap and think that Web3, you know, Web3 is trying to do the things that people hoped Web2 would do, you know, allow for the world to be more democratized, more equal, more accessible, but didn't do too well. You know, we're more monopolized than we've ever been. There's never been companies with as much power as Meta, Facebook, Google, et cetera. Um, but I just don't want people, you know, being a Web3 native, I don't want people to... You know, fall for that misconception. The Web3 is being built by the same creatures that built Web2 and Web1 and pre-Web, which are humans, which are you know, very imperfect creatures. Uh, and I think in the short term, you know, I don't expect Web3, I don't expect what Apple to lose a stranglehold on the, on, the, on the portals into the web, which is the you know, iPhone and, and the Apple store, the App Store. I think Web3 will not necessarily lead to more democratization, to a better world, to a more equal world, et cetera, more accessible world. We're hoping it does. It has the opportunity to do so because we're depending on code, which is a lot more perfect than humans, uh, but humans are building that code. So don't expect a utopia, expect a lot of innovation, expect a, a significant um, changes and disruptions to the way we live. And for, for intellectuals, you'll be able to see how society shifts over the next few years. And for business people, this is a great way to, to make a lot of money. Investors, it's going to be a lot of places to allocate capital. So it's a fascinating world for everyone. Whoa, I'm fascinated. If I wasn't fascinated before I joined this call, I certainly am now. Big smile from you, Sharad. Do you want to say a few words before I go to Sami? No, I think you should go to Sami. I 100% agree with every word that Mario spoke. So I'm with you, Mario. I second it. Oh, thank you so much. Um, Sammy, go on, take that on um, and show us how this all happens when you bring everything in and become that space. Sammy. <laughs> wow, I just am so impressed with everyone's definitions. They're so rich and I agree wholeheartedly with everyone. You know, the, it's a fundamental paradigm shift, right, uh, from Web 2 to Web 3, specifically when it comes to an individual level with ownership over our own data to then communities to then a society level. So the big shift from the metaverse perspective is that everything is becoming synchronous, real time, spatial and experiential. And it's this shared virtual economic system of joint uh, value creation. And there's this big emphasis on community, like uh, for all of these projects, whether it's a play to earn project or an NFT project, it's the community that is fundamentally uh, making this project happen and be successful uh, to a large degree. And uh, that's a major shift from, from a content creator perspective from Web2, where you'd have traditional followers on these siloed uh, platforms and you obviously don't have control over your own, your your data and your content and so it's unlocked this complete creative renaissance as well as financial and technological and um, I really agree I can't remember who said it but was it Mario the open metaverse I really agree with that because uh, we need uh, interoperability you know uh, the concept of taking let's say an avatar and being able to take it to different platforms that's just one example of interoperability but we're going to obviously encounter so many challenges to make this happen but I believe that's key uh, to making uh, the, the open metaverse functional and so challenges of of course the technological economic uh from a cultural design perspective like it's got to be appealing and fun because that's the culture and that's what what's going to drive mass adoption 
and of course, IP and intellectual property. And so uh, being a storyteller, I'm very interested in this perspective. Uh, so you have traditional companies like, you know, Disney and they make all these stories and animation and movies, but like, it's a complete shift on its head. Like when you're entering the Web3 space, you can be native in the, and activate in the metaverse and build a community and crowdfund via NFTs. And it's just a fundamental paradigm shift. And to make the metaverse happen, we're gonna need like uh, the content streaming environment of the metaverse I think will require like a computational efficiency improvement of over like a thousand times of today's standards. But, you know, we're going to get there. It's just a matter of time. I, I suspect probably around 2030, we'll see like more uh, things more crystallizing, but it's the convergence of all these technologies with uh, leveraging the blockchain. Thank you so much, Sammy. Thank you, uh, Mario, for throwing in some comments in chat. Um, and Sherrod, I know you're holding some chat questions. Um, can I ask something, Sherrod? I completely forgot earlier. Do we have any metapreneurs that are going to join us later today? Yes, we have a couple. And whenever you allow me, I will let them into the room. Perfect. That's yeah. fabulous. Um, so what we do there is we, we invite a couple of metapreneurs just to talk three minutes about what it is that's on their minds in there in their hearts and uh you know moving out there into web3 but mario i wonder if you could take this for us and thanks for the commentary you're putting in the chat there i'll have a little look at it but um i wonder if you could take this in now to uh you know actually sort of the runway if, if we're on the runway if we're on that train the web3 train um uh how, how what are the first steps for starting something up I mean, I heard earlier in the discussion, you don't really need any capital. Um, Mario, over to you, please. Um, so, so the question is like for, for an entrepreneur or someone wanting to enter the space, what would be the best way to do that? Is that the question, Susan? Just to make That's sure correct. I, That's correct. That's right. Okay. Yeah. In, uh, you know, if old mid business models work, what's new modeling is emerging and how do we take those? Oh, steps? okay. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah. Look, it's, yeah. it's, 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 this is an exciting aspect of, of the open metaverse because now, you know, there's a concept called de uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, DAOs, which I know most, if not all the panelists would know what that is. And that's the ability to, um, the, the, the organizational structure that we have today is shifting to a more democratized structure. So there's a lot of good signals that we're heading in the right way, potentially the right way, the right path, because it's never been tested. And essentially, that's a company owned, like I have a few companies, I call the shots, they're my companies. But a DAO, which we're doing a DAO because I love the concept, a DAO means anyone could own a piece of that company they can buy tokens into that company a lot of you know protocols function that way metaverses are essentially big DAOs, um and that will change the ability to raise capital because now you don't need to go to vcs and i know dejan will probably work in that space heavily you can raise capital from anyone following certain regulations um and anyone that gives you capitals not only giving capital and, and sitting passively watching the business grow they're actively participating in the business. It's never been done before to that extent. You know, equity crowdfunding is similar, but equity crowdfunding, you invest and that's it. So now there's the ability. And this, honestly, this is really fascinating for anyone listening. This is one of the most exciting aspects of Web3. With all the hype and everything happening, this excites me a lot, is that whatever business you're building, you can start, you know, start, with a decentralized way of structuring it where you don't call the shots anymore, but that's a process. You might call the shots initially, but gradually it becomes more and more decentralized. But at the same time, I just don't want people to, to think that, you know, the ease of raising money is not going to continue. You know, crypto corrected heavily recently and, and rightly so. Um, and don't do the same mistake. Everyone will do those mistakes. But if you're listening to this, try not to do the same mistakes everyone did back in 2017. And every time there's a new innovation, you know, the human brain tends to overestimate the short-term impact of innovation and underestimate the long-term potential. And it's happening again. Long-term, this will change the world in ways we cannot even imagine. Short-term, not every website is going to be a metaverse. Not every company, you know, all these different public companies are adding metaverse into their press releases, and they started doing that in mainly in 20, you know, after Roblox's IPO in 2020, there's been thousands of mentions of the term metaverse in press releases. Before that, before 2020, it was only five. Public companies want to increase their valuations. I know that because now I'm going to be, I'm training to become the CEO of a public company, and I know how they think. So that's the only reason. There is no users there. There's no practical reason to be in the open metaverse. In the closed metaverse, that's a different story. You know, hundreds of millions of users, Roblox is killing it. 
We're at the same level in terms of users as Facebook was in 2018, I think, or 2008, 2008, 150 million users, where a decade later, it went up by over 20x. Um, and innovations usually move faster at every cycle. So Web3 could grow faster than Web2, the same way Web2 grew faster than Web1, and Web1 grew faster than the mainframe era. Uh, so the space will move fast. Don't expect, you know, raise money. It's going to be a long-term play. In terms of the short term, if you want to start making money short term, if you're a startup entrepreneur and need capital quickly, instead of raising money and trying to build the next unicorn, you know, advise businesses on understanding the space and advise uh, businesses that are buying space. You know, there's a company we're working with called Metaverse. They're having a mall called The Mall and, it's, and businesses can buy space. That's interesting. But anyone could create a mall and, and businesses can buy space. Anyone can create a Metaverse. What they're doing is they're adding a service to it. Anyone that buys space they have an agency. It's existed since 2016, back in the XR days, Danny. Uh, so they know the space well before Web3. Um, and they, they help the business that's buying space. That's where, you know, entrepreneurship kicks in. They help them create utility. Or right, I have the space in the metaverse. What do I do in that space? So that's, you know, I hope I gave anyone listening a few ideas on what to do in the space and, and a few things to, to keep in mind um, to avoid, you know, overexcitement in the short term. Well, guess what, Mario? You did. <laughs> you, there are some lovely things in chat for you to look at. Uh, please comment on. And um, I'm going to go to you, um, my dear Dejana, because you were particularly animated. And uh, as you're commenting on that, can you also, if you could, go into um, you know how much is needed to start up, if at all? Um, you know, it talk money, but take on from Mario and then go into that, if you would, um, Dejana. Of course, Mario, number one, I'm so glad that all of us are here on the panel, but I get to, um, you know, shadow what Mario is saying because he's absolutely right. Now that we're in a DAO, um, there's a lot of great opportunities here. And from someone who has been capital raising well over a decade, I always tell startup founders, don't capital raise at first. Don't go into a product, um, you know, into a service immediately capital raising. Because uh, look, if I if I had to do like a, a the rise of cryptocurrency, it's relative to fiat currencies. Like, I mean, I'm American, so U.S. dollars, and it's the primary driver of. Um, you know, of, of, of our NFT, let's say obsession, but it's the fact that it's also a collectible, right? So anything that's authentic and anything that has a story attached to it can carry value. And we are the people, you know, we're the creators, we're the founders, we are the people that add value into this product. Um, and so that's what uh, allows us to then uh, fuel this conversation even further. When you are thinking about uh, you know, uh, funding, not even looking at it just solely from like an investor standpoint, but think about your holders, think about your community, think about the people that you are involved in. Um, people invest in people, not just into the product, right? So I know that Sherrod had put it in the comments, like, you know, being able to build a community and to build a network. Um, and it's, um, people are very anchored into how uh, companies, how startups uh, really um, see and grow and develop their team. So when you are thinking about, you know, jumping into this space, starting your own collection, adding a utility, whatever it is, um, you know, there's a lot of primary foundational focuses that has to really come into play at the absolute forefront, right? So, um, you know, number one, investors, and I'm saying investors slash holders community, I mean that all in tenfold. Investors don't want to see copies. When we're thinking about users, um, you know, investors want to see behavioral change. How do we shift from going from, you know, being uh, obsessed with MySpace and then saying, oh my gosh, yeah, we're going to stick with, with Facebook, right? So having that um, behavioral trends are really, really strong differentiators. And um, even when we're looking at a, a, an early startup or if we're in that ideation stage, just being able to show that your company is viable and having that proof of concept. So that proof of concept now is incorporated and backed by, you know, Web2, having um, a strong online community, having people um, perhaps really interested in the product. I'll give an example. There's a company that we're capital raising for at the moment and, you know, they're, they're now in their growth stage. So it's about a $52 million raise. Um, and it's to have uh, sustainability for a lot of these um, uh, in a government situation. That's as much as I can say. And 
the way that they prove their concept with zero capital, guys, absolutely zero capital. They built out the website, they built out the social media. Yes, they, they put up a little cash for press and, um, you know, for, for following, et cetera, for growth. Um, but what they ended up doing is that they sold a pre, uh, pre-conception and they didn't even have the product built up yet. So the product wasn't going to be fully developed until 10, 11 months. And they already have people buy into the concept already had uh, a waiting list. So within three months, they were able to raise on their own 1.2 million, which was then, uh, obviously, um, it caught a lot of attention from VCs because they bootstrap. So it is possible. It absolutely is possible to start a vision, to start, um, you know, a company, a collection, et cetera, with absolutely zero capital. But it has to be on the backbone of having an innovative product, have a really strong team. That's all in. And I mean, an all in team. It doesn't have to be like, oh, I have an ex Google or I have someone from an ex Twitter, but you have to have people that are absolutely dedicated and passionate to what it is that you're building because people in invest in people and people invest in the product, the product is a byproduct, really, right? So, um, and think about it as every single day, you as an investor, I have to be with this person or I have to listen to this person for the rest of, you know, however long I'm going to be um, invested in them. If I didn't like Sherrod, I wouldn't be in this panel. I wouldn't be contributing to his network, right? So it has to come from this more um, really uh, free flowing kind of honest relationship. Um, proof of concept, uh, proof of concept, and, and, and traction is a really really big thing that is possible to do even with zero zero capital. And I always say this: look for funding towards the end of you know, your, your ideation stage because you have to have all of these digital assets ready in play before you can really effectively go out into the market. Um, and one thing that is absolutely um, necessary is having uh, a reasonable cash burn rate, right? Because right now we're seeing a lot of these um, uh, NFT founders who wanna go in and uh, you know, after you know, they wanna raise X amount of money, let's say if it's $500,000, but then 12 months later, where did the capital go? So we have to have a realistic financial forecast when you are going into this space so that you can be um, you know, really, really successful. And thankfully there's great panels and networks like this um, that can really help shape and position you uh, into that space. Wow, thank you, Dejana. And that was almost you know, sort of a, a sprint workshop in one, wasn't it? So thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, we have a guest in the room, so get ready, Emmanuel. I'm gonna have Sherrod introduce you in two ticks. But um, Adriana, um, I mean, from a prod uh, NFT artist, product build point of view, can you give us just a quick, quick overview, insight, or even questions about what you've heard from our previous speakers, particularly just Dejana, over to you. Well, as I said before, I think the most exciting part of the NFTs personally for myself as well is that um, it can be attached to something physical, right? So it doesn't have to be necessarily just a digital token. We're talking about accessibility to a lot of opportunities and um, also physical aspects of it. Like, so um, I think that's what's really changing the game in for like any industry. And I'm talking about the creative industries uh, that I also would love to touch on what Sami was talking about, the community and uh, the importance of the following we have, you know, as individuals, as a business, as artists as well, because it, I think there's a misconception that um, as we put something out there as an NFT that will just get sold or, you know, it will just like immediately make millions out of it. It doesn't really work like that because it, there's a lot of uh, engagement and also marketing and also um, uh, energy that has to be put into the NFTs projects, like anything, it's like a startup business, right? So right now um, there's like two variables, like main variables about the NFTs if it comes to uh, art or like, uh, let's say for example, fashion business is that um, there's projects that are one-on-one -on -one NFTs, which is I specialize in right now. And that's what I've been doing is that there's only one NFT being created. It's treated as an art and as an art piece, but also there's like generative projects on NFTs. And for example, the board apes that I'm sure everyone is aware of, it's one of the projects that's been created like that, that it does provide the utility. So in the case of board apes, it's a membership of the board uh, Ape uh, Yacht Club. And that obviously uh, opens up the possibility to be networking with this community. And 
it's not necessarily about the artwork, but it's more about what the value does it provide. So I think that's where we have to look holistically as NFTs. It's not just artwork, it's not music, it's not a digital fashion wearable. It, it's so much more about the community. And I think that's how we need to look at it in terms of pro promotion as like also how we want to be perceived as an artist. And that's also what I'm interested in that, you know, even if I create one-on-one -on -one art pieces, it's very important to me, like, what do I give to my community? Is it just obviously there's a name to attach to the art or, you know, the amount of exhibitions I might have done or the collaborations with the big brands, but I mean, what I'm seeing is different in Web3 so far versus to Web2 is that um, it does help the experience that I have had. And for example, the big client names I've worked with the Web2, but I think the collectors right now are not looking necessarily at just that. They really want to see that engagement and what the kind of value I provide. And I think also right now it's very important to be present and very communicative and very, um, I would say genuine as well with this community because it's very easy to um, copy and paste what we we're just talking about what was working in Web2 but doesn't really necessarily work in Web3, which is, for example, um, that well, you know the presence uh, in Web3. It's it's completely different. Like I just saw it, which is very interesting. That, for example, I had a publication in a big fashion magazine on my exhibition, and that's something that would be very well received in Web2, but in Web3, it's like there's applause, but it doesn't really excite that audience as much as in Web2, which is very interesting to see for me. And I'm learning, it's a big curve, learning curve for myself. So well, let me help yes. you fit on that one as well. I mean, and all of us, uh, particularly this storytelling place and wordsmithing and looking at what vocabulary we use and, and un really getting the heart of the words and knowing that words matter. So for example, you know, in the old era, if we would say, well, what's our objective? Maybe in this AC, BC, before Corona, moving into AC era, we say, what's our intention? And before we might say, well, what's the outcome that we want of our objective? Maybe now we would say something like, what's the impact? we want from our intention and indeed what about what's the extraordinary impact extraordinary impact and indeed we would be looking for return on investment wouldn't we and now and we mooted a little earlier or at least I did about the different forms of capital or currency well if we say that currency comes from the word current and current is energy, positive and negatives making energy. You know, a currency can come from, as we're saying, talent, from ideas. And indeed, I hear you say engagement, which then perhaps brings us into a measurement of ROE, return on engagement, or even return on energy. And how do we measure that? So hold that question and hold that in the IP space, because Danny, I'll come to you after we've heard Emmanuel. So, um, Sharad, would you like to introduce Emmanuel, yeah, our metapreneur? Yeah, I'm going to introduce two metapreneurs and I will allow them three minutes of an elevator pitch because that's what we like to do on our show, recognize metapreneurs. And I was fortunate to meet Emmanuel in uh, real life, as they say, IRL, in Dubai last month. He's young, he's ambitious, he's already built his metaverse and I'll uh, give him three minutes now. Emmanuel, take it over. Thanks a lot, Gerard. Well, uh, I want to say thanks to everyone in the panelists. Uh, I've been talking with a few of you uh, over the last months. Uh, it's an honor to, to be a part of this. Um, and yeah, I, I love everything that you've been saying. Obviously, I'm, I'm building my metaverse, and yeah, I can claim that I have the best technology of the best partnerships, but that is not part of me. Um, what we really are is we are a DNA of, of the next metaverse. Uh, we are the DNA of the next generation. And what we're trying to do is to bring the Web3 culture into the next level, into a, a moralistic level where the people can interact between them in a peaceful way and, a, and with morals as well. So talking about return of investment, um, I'm, I'm, I'm inviting you guys that you are obviously the leaders of, of the metaverse. And, and this is not more of talk about me, it's talk about you. It's, uh, 
you guys have the power to set up the rules of, of the next of, of the next metaverse, right? Of the next open metaverse. And um, it's more an invitation of, of put your resources into the next generation and the morals of the next generation. So what we're trying to do as a metaverse is basically create that governance that allow people to interact between them in a peaceful way. So what happened when I have a guy of 40 years old dressed as a cat, or I have a kid of five years uh, dressed as a, as a cockatrial, like how, how that interaction looks like. What happened with you on your own data? And Facebook is not selling it for you. What happens when you have a 24-7 uh, opportunity to get into a virtual world that is basically your cell phone in front of your eyes? Um, those are the kind of rules that we have to set up as, a, as, a, as the metaverse leaders. And those are, are my concerns and obviously my, my structure and my base as a company to, to build the next metaverse. And yeah, obviously we have a scalability. We have, we have the tools, we have the cool fun stuff where, where I can fight against you and steal your NFTs. But um, I'm more into the governance and the legislation of the future of the metaverse. So that's, that's who I am. So that's, I'm, a, I'm a metaverse regulator. Wonderful, Emmanuel. Thank you so much. And indeed, you, you may have heard a little earlier, we were mooting um, uh, societal impact, um, you know, and it's sort of uh, attracting, if you like, the, we didn't continue with these words, but attracting love and peace, but understanding that there needs to be some prosperity in the middle. And indeed, just to say to you all, you know, this alternative strategist in me actually is at the intersection of strategy and spirituality in the digital space, but that spirituality is talking in before you talk out and again respecting that words matter they really do matter and you know in this sort of ownership economy that we now have for us where we can all be in and part of the way it all um, emerges creates and morphs and reshapes um, it's quite interesting Sharad that you called in our dear friend Jamie Brett today because Jamie I swear every webinar I mention you and Emmanuel you will love this bridge because one of the things that steps, stands out for me from Jamie, who I first met in January, and we're outstanding a call, is that, um, and I didn't know he was going to be on now, this is a surprise, is Jamie, you talked about digital economic justice. Am I correct? And that really talks straight into you and Emmanuel and this love, prosperity and peace for all children, you know, and we're the children too. Jamie, take it away. Fantastic. Thank you so much for such a kind introduction. Um, so I'm mainly kind of, we've got a webinar coming up on the uh, 18th of May, and it's really related to the one that we've just uh, just heard about when we're looking at the economics of the metaverse and how does that work. So one of the goals of the metaverse is to replicate the feeling of real world connection by creating these immersive environments. And that provides a real unique opportunity to evolve participation in society by leveraging virtual technology. However, as we've transitioned to the information age and a digital economy, we've witnessed how pre-existing inequalities and barriers present in the material world can further combine with digital inequalities, further disenfranchising and magnifying those inequalities who, to those who already face the greatest adversities. So what we have seen largely with Web 1 and Web 2 products is they've been designed around people who are most able to participate. So much so that we've created inaccessibility and inequity because there hasn't been enough done to anticipate the attitudinal, financial, social enablement or policy bar barriers that marginalized groups face. So I want to just look at this through one lens, which is just for disability for this perspective. Um, but one in five people are disabled. If you add in non-disposable income and other funds that disabled people have influence over, that's eight trillion in, the, in global purchasing power and 73% of potential disabled customers have experienced, um, sorry, 73% of disabled customers have experienced barriers on a quarter of the websites that they visit. So this provides a real opportunity to shape how the metaverse is going to operate. And I'm constantly looking for ways that we can create equitable opportunities, evolve participation for all genders, ethnicity, sexualities, neuro abilities, bodily abilities, religious beliefs and backgrounds. So the webinar that we have coming up is aimed at giving you useful frameworks, models and perspectives that could be considered 
throughout the development of the metaverse and Web3 in the pursuit of a kinder, ethical, more inclusive, digitally enabled future. I'll pop a link in the chat now. You can find out more about myself, some of the work that we're doing, the growing list of free resources that we have, and the registration link for that webinar as well. Um, but if it's something you're interested in, we'd love to see you there. And thank you all so much to the panelists because it's been a really, really insightful chat and I've, I've enjoyed every minute of listening to it. Bless thank you, you, Jamie. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jamie. I've already put a link in the chat. Uh, we are hosting Jamie Brett on 18th May at 11 a.m. Dubai time. Uh, it's on inclusivity and accessibility in the metaverse. So please uh, register for this one. And uh, back to you, Susan, with some uh, closing comments from all panelists. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, I actually wanted, I know I said I'd come to you next, Danny, but I wondered, Emmanuel, could I bridge back over to you and speak into, um, you know, the commonalities and the, the heart space between you and Jamie? Over to you, Emmanuel. Yeah, sure. So um, it's it's beautiful what what uh, what Jamie is trying to do. I highly I highly um, agree away with the culture that we have to bring all the people in a in a meaningful way inside the metaverse. But what is that meaningful way? It's it's lose ourselves as a, as a humans and what what are the rights that we're bringing to the metaverse and. When when we build when we are building these these new technology, I can see I can see people that are are disabled having experience where they can run and they can fly and do all this beautiful stuff, and it's wow okay that's I I totally agree with you, but why are you spending sixteen hours per day there? Okay, what what is this new world reality? And uh, yeah, so so it's it's how it's the balance. And this is the philosophy that we have to discuss is, okay, I'm, I'm giving you the opportunity to have the best life that you can have. Now, what are you going to do with that? And how can I help you to have, to have a balanced life between virtual life and a, and a real life? And it's seriously like, it's, it doesn't take profit for me. It's not like the algorithms of Facebook that are touching you seven hours per day and you're just watching and watching uh, the same loop of information ever, over and over. It's, I know that I can create an economy with you in the metaverse and outside the metaverse using augmented reality. So for example, I can put you to run with, uh, with dragons next to you and uh, you can have a, a healthy run every day and uh, still spend two or three hours in the metaverse. So. I highly invite uh, and I highly agree with with uh, with Jamie. And obviously, we can have a further discussions about this, um, about this, and talk about Utopia Metaverse. And please, if you can follow inside all the social medias, is U Topia Metaverse. Uh, that would be great. And thanks a lot. We will, uh, my dear Emmanuel. Thank you very, very much. And the word that I'm going to take from um, that um, uh, um, preamble in honor of our title today, the economic reality of virtual experience is the word balance. And I'm gonna give it over to you, Danny, to see if you can fold balance into um, uh, some, well, I don't know, summarize what you've heard, what's landed for you, and then go into IP, intellectual property. And if indeed that fits in this world, over to you for balance, Danny. Well, that's a, that's a, I'm the worst person to ask about balance. I've spent the last 27 years working on metaverse technology and 3D web platforms, and God knows what else. But um, yeah, but I don't I don't really believe in work life balance, right? I believe in doing what you're passionate about, and if you're enjoying that, then then go for it. it doesn't apply to everyone, but for me, it's just yeah. You know, there's no end to a day. I just live days and I do stuff that I enjoy. Some of it I don't enjoy, but it's on the pathway to to what I enjoy. So balance. Well, I guess you do at some point figure out that you need to take things uh, you know, at, a, at a, a reasonable pace. And uh, you know, one of the- Can the I just say that, something there? Just sure. to, to, to hone it. What is so interesting is that you heard the word balance in terms of harmony of personal energy in work and life. And so yeah. that's a really interesting thing. So when we say we're be awake to listen, what you were awake to listen to there was that 
definition of balance. So I just invite you later to have a little sit down and think about that, Danny. But now bring us straight into IP and I'm coming over to you, Mario, next. Uh, Danny. Yeah. So, so the, the reason I mentioned balance is because it's on everyone's minds. Uh, a lot of the stuff we're doing is remote workers. We're talking a lot about mental health. We're really dealing with um, people's energy that being put into the digital world. And you know, we've got to also cover things like you know, the, the metaverse and 3D environments can be very addictive. Uh, they can really uh, drag you in and you can, before you know it, spend a lot more time than you was really worth your while. Um, so in, in regards to intellectual property, I think you know, we're at a really great point where we can leverage everything that's been done in web so far and I'll apply that to 3D. And so uh, we are finding, for instance, the business we run, uh, we have a platform for building virtual events, virtual training, and people come in, they use that platform. It's a lot like Unity or Unreal, but it's our own engine. And people build their own experiences in it. They own the intellectual property and all of the content they put into it and the experiences themselves, and they syndicate and sell that to other providers. We're talking mainly in the business sphere here. But then others upload assets into the uh, you know, 3D platform and they use them. One of the, the tricky things of maintaining intellectual property and something that the blockchain does really well is sort of signifying the title of ownership over something. I think we need to go to the next stage where the, the, the title and the item of intellectual property is, is completely combined so that there is that that's immutable as well, that the, the actual item that we're talking about. But it gets really complex and tricky when you start talking about multi-user. NFTs are great, uh, and but when you start talking about bringing items in and uh, making them exclusive to someone, uh, in a 3D environment, it starts to get really tricky. And I, I don't really see a lot of solutions having solved that. Yes, you can go look up the title to talk about uh, who owns it, but the cap capability of someone else reusing that, I'm talking about you know, digital rights management, is something that's still looking to be resolved and isn't being resolved necessarily with blockchain technology. Uh, but it is an interesting space. I have a number of lawyer friends and IP friends that we discuss these things over drinks every now and then, and it's, it's a fascinating topic. But there are solutions in the works. Uh, nothing I can talk about yet, but uh, you know, definitely stuff that's going to be coming out that solves these problems uh, at a global scale. So really exciting time to be involved in this. Yeah, hear, hear. And indeed, one of my sort of favourite book titles is by Diane Musher Hamilton, and it's called everything is workable. Everything is workable. And so let's see what Mario has to say about, about that. And Mario, can you treat this as your closing as well? Can yeah, you? Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, so balance, you know, I, I got a few points when you mentioned balance. First one is, you know, a web three, you know, thought that would have immediately is the balance incentives. That's what web three allows us to do. You know, Adriano will probably agree with this from, from an arts perspective, is that, and DAOs allow for balance incentives as well, is that anyone that's participating, that's inv in investing there is also participating in building the business. So that's probably one way of looking at balance in this space. Um, another way is, is the imbalance we'll see between humans and code, because what we're doing, and we've been doing this for a long time now, is moving more and more functions of our society from being in the hands of, of humans to, to being in the hands of code. And we've seen this even before that, from having an emperor uh, run a society, make the decisions to having a democracy, a system. And now we're moving democracies and other systems into code. So I think it's a, it's a great step in the right direction because that, that uh, kind of makes up for the imperfections of humanity, but it's also an unknown that could uh, have a lot of shortfalls. Uh, as Danny's point, a balanced life, uh, yeah, it's not going to happen anymore because, you know, we're like, I got, I got my AirPods always with me. I, I'm, I'm, I'm always plugged into the web two metaverse, whatever you want to call it. Um, so it's going to be harder to achieve balance, work-life balance. Um, and the line between work and life will be very thin as well, because, you know, if you're working in the metaverse, you're, 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 you know, there's no office and home you go to, there's no home in the metaverse. Um, there could be different metaverses, different ecosystems. You can move from one to another, uh, but it, you know, it, it's just such a gray world that it's hard to predict what will happen. Um, another one is, is a topic, I think, Jamie, you're talking about that, um, uh, equality. And uh, Emmanuel was talking about having a utopian society. Um, we'll see. I really don't know. And I think I already touched on that before. Um, will the metaverse, you know, Web 2.0, Web 1.0 was expected to, you know, Web 1 was meant to democratize our world and, and you know, get it closer to a utopia and then web two messed all this up 
will Web3 kind of make up for the imperfections of Web2 or will it, will it improve it? So uh, that's, uh, that's to see whether that will have balance or not. Um, and then for IP, um, yeah, uh, it, it, Danny's explained it to us. Nothing I want to add. I don't want to repeat what Danny said. He, he's articulated it really, really well. Uh, but yeah, that, that's what I thought of when I mentioned balance and uh, appreciate you all having me. Oh, bless you, Mario. Thank you so much. That was so rich. There was so much there. I think you gave us four or five nuggets uh, building on Danny's and, and uh, Jamie's and Emmanuel's um, uh, really, I don't know, sort of very relevant and timely topics, I think. Um, Neo, do you agree? What have you got to say about all of this? And can you turn that into your close, please? Sure. Um... I think I have a lot to um, you know talk about, but I think we have limited time right here. Okay, to go, just go, you go. You um, so I, I'm really glad that uh, Mario mentioned the term open metaphor. So uh, from a technical perspective, we, we, we do have problem to solve. So uh, web one is about read, web two, read, write. Finally, web three, we talk about ownership. We own something or maybe institutional own something or this kind of individuals own some kind of piece of tokens that you could be having. But then when you look at the ownership on the technical terms today, it's all about a, a, a key value pairs on a mapping storage that is of a smart contract that deploy to a specific chain. Meaning that if you uh, own that token uh, for that specific smart contract, doesn't mean you own the same in other smart contract or you know that of other chains. So you own something in for that smart contract in, in Ethereum, ecosystem doesn't mean you own the same in Clayton. So how does it work? Like, like how do we solve this problem? Are, you, are we going to have this kind of federated style of ownership? Are we going to have chain elastic ownership? Everything's based on interoperability, right? That when we talk about open metaphors. So you, I think you will start seeing a lot of, uh, you know, uh, standards being set up, a lot of uh, uh, wallet that can support different chain because that's how they talk about the interoperable bit of it. So my point was interoperability could be these, uh, you know, base blockchain protocol or the two links around the blockchain or even uh, for the games, which is the use cases that could you have some kind of cross game avatar. But to me, when I look at cross game avatar, this is as essentially an NFT this is, uh, um, you know, um, you know, cross owned by uh, different smart contracts. Actually, based on the smart contract, right, the ownership. So uh, that deployed to different chain, or maybe even from a layer one perspective, could we have a like a something we call the only chain? You can have bunch of layer one, you know, grouping together. So when people deploy their smart contract or developers deploy their smart contract on one chain, it means the same to others. So we are on to these missions to be having an open matter first from a blockchain perspective. We don't want to have multi metaverse, or even though we don't want to have one single big, you know, so called metaverse. But then, last but not least, when you talk about metaverse, for my, <laughs> for my uh, kind of understanding or my 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 definitions would be metaverse the matter coming from the metadata that we store on chain with the mapping storage, which is the smart contract, with the smart contract. So really, the metadata uh, the metadata that we see. Uh, how we keep calling about this kind of PFP project, um, you know, they are static, uh, they are, you know, uh, non-fungible, yes. But then we start seeing a lot of uh, non-fungible tokens type of it. Uh, for example, I, I worked for a, you know, a, a diamond company before we start to build some kind of physical NFT, meaning that you can, you know, bundle uh, one NFT with their digital uh, uh, twins, which is the NFT. But then we start seeing a lot of things like what we have been working at Clayton, which is the dynamic NFT, because we feel like and we see the metadata will be changing because of the uh, environment or this kind of metrics in the metaverse. For example, Avatar is one of the examples. You're not going to expecting the same profile. You're not going to be expecting the same metadata right that across different time, uh, you know, time series right that in the same metaverse. So, metaverse uh, and the NFT, we're going to see more dynamic and more types of uh, different NFTs going forward. But I think that will be me. And thank you very much for your invite and thanks for having me. Oh, thank you, Neo. I mean, I'd love to toss some of that out into the room, but as you said, with time, I won't. So we need another one, uh, Sharad, another webinar. We've got 10 minutes. I've got three of you to close. So, Sammy, can I come over to you? I mean, how do we storytell all of this and then come into a close for you, Sammy? Yeah, sure. I just want to add to the point earlier as well about balance. I was thinking about it, right? And I was thinking 
from an economic point of view, a technological point of view, from a cultural point of view, and from an individual perspective. So like from an economic point of view, um, there was a great paper by Jamie Burke on Metafy. I highly recommend reading it if you haven't, um, Web3 Accelerator. And they're talking about how it's different protocols, uh, products and services, which enable the complex uh, interplay between non-fungible and fungibility. And so key attributes of Metafy is obviously gamification, composability, and it's basically when you can use a variety of financial tools. So there's that balance between traditional crypto stable coins nfts uh, central bank digital currencies as well as in-game tokens and the in-game token economic system so this is a really interesting concept uh, to trace and when now when i think about technological and balance uh the big one for me is uh ai and humans uh, i think mario was speaking about it earlier and so obviously um i have a show actually called future humans and kathy hackle was my first guest and another guest i had was a uh, David Hansen uh, and Sophia the robot and uh, it was really interesting hearing what he had to say about Sophia Dow and connected with uh, uh, the singularity and decentralized AI and so when I think of AI there's just so many different ways that it's going to be uh, deployed in the metaverse uh, from like an individual perspective and how we'd live day to day in the metaverse something to think about from an ethical perspective is like uh, deep fakes and uh, this connects fundamentally to your self sovereign identity so like I, I personally believe like we kind of need like a proof of humanity kind of like on a website. And we talk to chatbots, you know it's like almost like it passes the Turing test or maybe it does for some people like it's like that narrow AI can fool you. And so it's going to be magnified and amplified when we take everything spatial and we have these interactions with other avatars So right now i'm motion capture i'm a human driving this uh, fictional super sentient AI superheroine character, but you know uh, we got to be wary like um, you know there'll be kids in the metaverse I know epic games and Lego are trying to build like a kids friendly metaverse but. All of these ethical considerations and regulations need to be sorted up front uh, before everything is fully crystallized uh, because you know it's going to impact our way of living and we have a choice now to think about this and to deploy it and uh, okay from a cultural perspective with balance this relates to your question um, about storytelling and so. I'm very passionate about this. And uh, I also had uh, uh, Paul Jenkins and Joe on my show. Joe was uh, ex from Disney and Paul Jenkins actually wrote Spider-Man and was part of Marvel. And now they uh, set up their company, Meta X Studios. And so they are very interested in storytelling and the dynamic with the community. And so it's this cultural interplay where the community is also invested in building the story. And then finally, from a balanced perspective with individual, I call myself like a spiritual technologist. So, you know, I think we need to have that balance with our real life <laughs> like not just in these digital uh landscapes but that being said the metaverse will like seamlessly interrelate with the physical world like especially when we have smart glasses and everything becomes democratized so yeah that's uh from me oh wow see there again look another webinar Sherard, in just that one bundle beautiful bundle for you sammy thank you so much um i mean what i'm, I'm not going to pluck anything out except maybe if balance still wants to live on um adriana can i take it over to you um to just sort of give us what's coming for you now and come into a close and talk about balance if you would like can we we'll come off mute for you as well let's get you Sorry. Uh, yes, I was just saying that I'm very glad that balance uh, came up in this webinar because it's something that we really need to watch out for, especially coming into Web3. And the time has speeded up so much since I joined the NFTs. And I'm sure everyone can also agree that uh, a week kind of transpires um, into, wait, vice versa, one day in the NFT space feels like a week that's just gone by or even more. So it's very important to keep that mental health uh, balance uh, in the space. And I learned it also myself a hard way uh, when I was doing my NFT exhibition that it was a balance between physical and also web free. And I'm sure everyone we have entrepreneurs here and also artists that it's something to watch out for. Um, although I really also like what Mario was saying about being plugged in constantly and jumping on calls. I think that's, we already sort of are connected with it. And I think going forward i think also what he said is something about passion is that and uh, also um i think danny mentioned that as well if you work and you do something what you love uh it's so much easier to navigate the balance because we can pour into a day of work like 15 hours a day 
and it still will feel exciting. And I think that's very important to going forward with the NFTs or whether Web3 and you know blockchain is that making sure that what we're doing is something that's really aligned with our purpose. And uh, I also love what uh, Emmanuel said about you know that human spiritual side of it is that it's very important not to lose that part because if we're going there just for the wrong reasons for Web3, like just like popularity or money, I don't think that's the right approach because that's we have to think about long-term gain. And for me as an artist, obviously I'm mostly fulfilled when I create something and that resonates with my audience. So all the projects I want to do in the Web3 will probably be linked to something I'm really passionate about. So that keeps me alive, that keeps me going. It's just a matter of like transferring it into Web3 and the new possible technologies and also community that's really global. And, um, and that's obviously the blessing and it can be a curse that we're so interconnected. We're like really right now in the different parts of the world and we're able to have this webinar, which is fantastic. And I, that's one of the things I'm really passionate about this community, but at the same time, we know that there's no barrier when it comes to time difference anymore. And it's just I think watching out for uh, tuning in with yourself and making sure that what we're doing is coming up from passion and your um, genuine um, love of what we've been, at, you know, in why we're in this industry versus the actual, you know, financial gain of it. I would say that's my, uh, advice going forward and that's why I want to apply with my own practice as well. Well thank you so much I mean again I'm loving it from that sort of strategy uh, and spiritual intersection that there's the economic reality of our virtual experiences really does enable all forms of currency and energy and um, uh, collective play to come together uh, and indeed um, real camaraderie which brings me over to you Dejana so, I mean, can you sort of help close us in on maybe saying whatever you would like about what's been said in a nutshell, but really honing into um, what does success look like? Over to you, Dejana. Thank you, Susan. And um, I just want to say thank you guys so much being on this panelist of just world class caliber uh, experts has just been extremely, extremely humbling. And we are every one of us here has just such an incredible opportunity because the way that I see it, um, you know, just from an investor standpoint, it's raining investments, right? If we were just to navigate from 2020 till last year in 2021, um, we have seen the rise of just Web3 companies on a daily base getting funded from 1.3 to now you know, 3.5 on a daily basis. So what that means is that there's more unicorn companies that are happening because of Web3, because of everything that all of us are doing brick by brick every single day. And, you know, the Web3 investment market has never been more accessible. So, you know, investors are really rallying now behind developing, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, developer teams with an idea and, I genuinely believe that while capital continues to flow freely in our space, um, you know, the fundamentals and the foundations is always going to stay the same and the stakes, right? So if we're saying like the risks and the upside, um, it's never been higher, but then that gives us more motivation and passion what, um, you know, what Danny and what Adriana and what a, a number of these panelists have been saying, because the amount of potential value in strong decentralization um, uses is like, it, it's unimaginable to people who perhaps may not have tapped into our space yet. So, um, you know, for us to increase that growing interest in, in the market, um, the funding has to touch eventually, uh, you know, um, top talent, human capital. And I think that it was really perhaps difficult to find in web two, but now with our community and our network and the um, degree of separation being even closer in proximity, we have access to all of these resources very, very, very quickly. So um, I think, you know, I want to just uh, end this off with just saying that web three really needs um, new leaders and new founders such as ourselves to really designate um, uh, a better ecosystem and it's up to us to really grow and to continue and to, to heed the way. So I think that it's, it's really inspirational to hear every single day, whatever, whatever it is that people are working on, because um, I think a lot of these investors, a lot of these institutional 
um, uh, institutions, these uh, investors really have to put a lot of efforts and capital and backing to what it is that we're building. Um, and so I think the core drivers for Web3 are value-based and financially driven, um, but that financially driven aspect can be really, uh, can have that core foundation of community building. So, um, you know, I think that- I'm going to just say, Dejana, thank you so much for bringing in the word leadership. Yes. I mean, that is just an incredible bridge for us to end on. And it actually, Sherrod, can bridge right into May 18th yet again. I know we've got um, you and Jamie in conversation that day, but we've also got a webinar that day called Leadership in Tech, would you believe, Dejana? Is that correct, uh, Sherrod? Yeah, and that's another strong panel, and we have 12 panelists on that one. So I don't know how you're going to handle that, Susan, but uh, that's going to be another amazing conversation. And I think um, it's, it's the right time for me to say a big thank you to each of our panelists. And uh, Susan, a big thank you to you for weaving this conversation. And I'm sure there are a lot of uh, takeaways for our audience uh, here. And uh, till we see you next time. Um, yeah, my studio manager would like all of us to pose for a photograph. So if we can have your best pose right now, the studio manager is going to snap us and we'll be on social media in about 15 minutes from now, I promise you. Look this way, Mario. That's it, yeah. boy. <laughs> please, please look, look into the camera. Okay, not I'm, at each I'm other. Neo, Adriana. Oh, look at Mario, you naughty, naughty. <laughs> right. Yeah, and thank you to our audience for staying with us uh, and Absolutely. investing. Yeah, investing your 90 minutes with us. And I leave you with this thought, and that is very simple. If you have seen the metaverse bandwagon, you have missed it. You have to be on it. I leave you with that thought. Thank you, and see you on the other side. Bye. Let's say a big bye bye to everyone bye -bye. from the panel. Bye. Bye. bye.